now that we know that these antibiotic resistant and drug resistant microbes are in our environment, what are we doing to find new treatments? And there's two things I want to talk about. The first is phage therapy. I don't know if anyone has heard about this, but this is a fascinating new development. If you're keeping, taking notes, phage is P-H-A-G-E, phage, which is short for bacteriophage. So over close to 100 years ago, it was discovered that there are these naturally occurring viruses called bacteriophages, some people pronounce them phage, I say phage, which can cause bacteria to explode. And there was a lot of t work in the 1970s and 80s, mostly in Eastern Europe, places like Lithuania and Latvia, where they were developing bacteriophage therapy to treat infections. But for whatever reason, it just kind of fell by the wayside. But we have found that it's coming back. And it came back in a big way in May of this year, a month after the Candida auris story hit. And I'll say that the Candida, we'll get back to the Candida auris in a minute, but just to say chronologically, the next big thing to happen with superbugs was the return of bacteriophage. And the way this works was exemplified in the treatment of a 15-year-old girl from London who had an infection in her lung with a superbug called Mycobacterium abscessus. It was on the front page of the Wall Street Journal that this girl had gone through two years of antibiotic treatment <clears throat> without cure. And they had cured her using phage therapy. And the way they did it was with something called CRISPR. People familiar with CRISPR? It is an enzyme. I don't want to get this into be a science lesson, but there are certain things that you can, I think, take away from and, and go dig deeper into. And one of them is CRISPR, which is C-R-I-S-P-R. CRISPR is a molecular scalpel that allows us to chop up DNA. And it allowed us to chop up this phage treatment. And so they created three phages. They gave them to a girl, and they cured her. Success. And I was immediately asked to comment on this. And they said, well, what do you think about it? And I said, well, I think I'm very happy for this girl. But the problem with phage therapy is that it is incredibly narrow spectrum. What I mean by that is that when people try to develop new antibiotics, they want broad spectrum. They want an antibiotic that can broadly treat every bacterium in this room, every infection you may have. They don't want something that can only treat you. But that's essentially what phage therapy does. It's essentially personalized medicine. It's precision medicine. But there's a downside to that, which is that someone has to study it to make sure it's safe. These things, we don't know much about them. I certainly wouldn't give it to my own mother, yet. And the question is, who's gonna take up investing billions of dollars in something that could only treat, let's say, mycobacterium obsessus affects a few hundred people a year? The finances become very thorny, and it looks to be a place, potentially, where the federal government could pick up the slack. If you're somebody who's out there who likes having the government involved in your health care, this would be a great opportunity for them to do more. So phage therapy, is, and there's a book about this um, called The Perfect Predator, about a woman whose uh, husband was saved using phage therapy. And I will say that that is something that we're going to be hearing more about in 2020 and beyond. But there's something else that's even more exciting about where we're looking for the next cures for superbugs. And that's in the soil beneath our feet. This will be point number five that I'd like you to take away from this, which is that the soil is an incredible place for antibiotic discovery. Why would that be? Well, if you recall what I told you about Alexander Fleming, that what he discovered was that there was this fungus that was making a chemical, secreting a chemical into the environment that could kill bacteria. Well, it turns out that in the soil beneath our feet, there are trillions of microbes in every square meter of soil that are engaged in a subterranean warfare, survival of the fittest, where they are all secreting little chemicals. Some of those chemicals are designed to kill others, 
Some of those chemicals are designed to find like-minded microbes, something called quorum sensing, where a bacteria will submit a, send out a little chemical that will identify other bacteria that are similar to it. But the thing we're interested in are the bacteria that are secreting chemicals that are designed to kill other bacteria. Because if you think about it, if we can pluck one of those out, we've got ourselves an antibiotic. And so what we're doing, largely at the Rockefeller University in Manhattan, is we're using artificial intelligence to try to identify where we should hunt for more antibiotics. And as a proof of principle, one of the researchers I work with, a guy named Sean Brady, he asked people to send in soil from Prospect Park in Brooklyn. And he collected the samples, and he found more than two dozen new drugs. It's incredible. The question is, what do you do with those findings? Because as I said, any new chemical that you find in the dirt requires at least a billion dollars worth of investment and testing before you know it's safe. And I'll tell you that Sean Brady found in the soil a new drug to treat MRSA. It's called malacidin. If you want to look it up, M-A-L-A-C-I-D-I-N. And he met with me, and he is rapidly producing more malacidin. And I said, great, can I come over to your laboratory and see? And he said, oh, we're making it in China. And I said, okay, well, when you have enough of it, let's test it. Because he's shown that it can kill MRSA. And so what I do is I then would study it in rabbits and in mice and then in humans. And the way we're trying to figure out where that we should look is through artificial intelligence, which really blew my mind when I first heard about this. And the idea is that many of the antibiotics that we use today have similar structures. You ever see the structures a chemist will draw on the board that's got all these stick figures? Well, those are atoms that are separated in space. And what we can do is train a computer to say, okay, so penicillin looks like this. Look for something that looks like this but has a little extra something else on it. And we can rapidly scan through literally tons and tons of soil trying to find things that are, look like the antibiotics that we know are safe and effective, but are a little bit different. And then something interesting happened after we've started this hunt in the soil is that I was contacted by The Atlantic, which is uh, the, the magazine. And they said, we'd like you to comment on this new in, um, quest led by Craig Venter, the guy who uh, sequenced the human genome. He thinks the next great place to find antibiotics is at the bottom of the ocean. I said, really? That's news to me. But it led me on a quest, and one of the reasons I enjoy doing this is that I learn every day something new. And his theory is that at the bottom of the ocean must be some extraordinary organisms that can live in such harsh environments. And whatever's down there, if we can scoop them up and bring them back, they've probably got something important to tell us about survival. It's an interesting idea. I wouldn't want to invest in it, but if a billionaire wants to invest in it, I think it's a reasonable approach. We're also looking in the tundra. People are going to the Arctic, the Antarctic, and looking to see, is there anything alive deep down in the ice? And this is one of the, I think, wonderful stories about superbugs and about life, is that it finds a way. And we're trying to learn from everything around us how can we figure out ways for our species to survive, learning from some that are able to survive for thousands of years?